Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Hey everyone, welcome to the Work From Home Show. I'm Naresh Fissa with Adam Schrader. Shout out to all our homies, homeboys, homegirls, home trans, all the Work From Homers out there. Today we have Patrick K. O'Donnell on the show. He is the founder of The Drop Zone, a virtual museum, and multiple number one New York Times bestselling author, including 12 books and scores of films and documentaries spanning the American Revolution to the Battle of Fallujah. He is a leading expert on America's elite and special operations units. His popular books include... We were one shoulder to shoulder with the Marines who took Fallujah, Washington's Immortals, the untold story of an elite regiment who changed the course of the revolution, rode Washington across the Delaware, and Give Me Tomorrow, the Korean War's greatest untold story, the epic stand of the Marines of George Company. His latest book is called The Indispensables, the Diverse Soldier Mariners Mariners Who Shaped the Country, Formed the Navy. So without further ado, Patrick K. O'Donnell, welcome to the Work From Home Show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Let's start about your writing career. You're a military historian. How did you get into military history and specifically into the writing of military history? Sure. Um, well, I've been into this stuff since I was about four years old. Um, you know, I watched too many episodes of Hogan's Heroes, played with G.I. Joes. And then I had a library of about four or 500 books when I was eight and dragging my parents all around the country to battlefields. So this has been a more or less a lifelong obsession. And I've spent most of that time in the field, either interviewing people or going to places. And, you know, the books that I've written have all found me in one way or another. And I also earned my title combat historian by being in Iraq for three or four months. And I was in the Battle of Fallujah as a volunteer combat historian. And I, uh, I, I fought with a Marine rifle platoon. And I, as you mentioned earlier, a book I wrote called We Were One. It's on the Commandant's reading list, which is required reading for the Marine Corps. And it's about my experience, but it's also about eight best friends and their story in the battle of Fallujah where only three of them came home from Iraq. So one of the, your new book, the indispensables, I mean, I, I read the Washington, a life by Ron Chernow years, several years ago. And, you know, the story is referenced in it. You know, it talks about the actual happening. Your book goes much more in depth. How do you, can you tell us a little bit about the story of what happened? And then also how do you figure out exactly like, how do you craft the story? I mean, that's, you know, 200 and almost 50 years ago that this happened. How do you craft a story from gathering? Like, what sources are you gathering from to do that? Oh, the the book's got over a thousand endnotes. They're all primary sources, mainly uh, pension applications, diaries, letters, etc. It's just a, a wide source, including uh, British and Hessian sources. Um and they come from all over the world. A lot of it is parchments and, you know, you have to understand and decipher handwriting that's two, oh, nearly 250 years old that you can barely make out. But this is a story that's very, it, it's a small, all my books are basically small stories that tell a larger story. And this, this story, the indispensables tells the story of the Marblehead men uh, that were, really the forerunner that they were the main, our main found some of the founding fathers of the American revolution that nobody's heard of and uh, principal financers of the revolution. They were also the idea men of the revolution, but they also were part of an elite regiment called the 14th continental or the, the, the Marblehead regiment. And they fought in nearly all the major campaigns and battles in the first two years of the war. And that's what, this book basically begins in 1769 with um, the Marblehead men resisting the crown 
and interference from the crown and government interference. And then it, it leads up to the revolution itself where these men are the leading figures in the revolution and the later subsequent revolutionary war. Uh, they are the main idea people. They're the main financers. They bring in something very important, gunpowder. Um, the colonists had guns, but they didn't have any powder, and the British knew that, and they went after us and tried to disarm us. Because if you don't have um, weapons to defend yourself, it doesn't matter how um, much of a political revolution you have, it'll be snuffed out by military force. And the, the British recognized our Achilles heel was gunpowder, and they were constantly trying to confiscate it. But it was the Marblehead men that brought it in from their um, their their, their, their trading contacts in Spain, and our first foreign aid comes from Spain. This is part of an untold story that's part of the Indispensables, and it's it's this is a character-driven book. Um, it's a narrative history. It's not some sort of dry history or regimental history. It's very much fleshed out with characters and events, and you you feel like you're kind of walking in their footsteps as you go through the Revolutionary War. With regard. With regard to covering events and your writing your books, do you do all this from home and just make phone calls, talk to people, or are you actually traveling all around the country, interviewing experts, going out on the field to cover these stories? Well, in most cases, the stuff I write is an untold story, so I'm the expert and the only person that knows it. But what I do do is I am in the field all the time. I'm, I'm going to the places that they fought. I'm going to their homes where they lived. I'm looking for artifacts that relate to the events that bring me back to a time and place that I'm writing about. Um, I also visit the, the graves of the, the men and women that I write about. Um, it's very extensive, and it's primary sources that drive the, the narrative. And... Uh, I come up with the storyline and I typically write books backwards in many ways or write them based on the low hanging fruit or the chapters that I find the most interesting. And I write everything kind of in a modular fashion. I write uh, chapter by chapter, everything's written on chapter basis. And then I fit those chapters together and, um, and then you have a book and that takes about five years in many cases. So you talk about going out and like, you know, reading these diaries and letters. Are you, are you going to like museums where people have given them or how are you finding these? They're all over the place. Um, for instance, I went to the Marblehead Historical Society. I went to the Beverly Historical Society, Peabody Essex Museum in Massachusetts. This stuff's all over the place. And it's, it's not in one single repository. It's even in the National Archives. Um, but also it's a uh, hardcore genealogy in many ways. Um, I had to do a genealogy on hundreds of people in this book and that is intense, uh, trying to figure out when they were born, who they married and whether or not they left behind any, any written words about their experience. In some cases, they, if they were lucky enough to survive the American revolution, they would apply for a federal pension. And this began in 1820 when many of these men were very, very old um, and many were, were very, very poor. And uh, they would go down to the local courthouse and swear under oath what they saw and did. And this is the great oral history of the Revolutionary War that many authors have never. I was the first to really use it in great length with Washington's Immortals. And then I did it again with uh, the Indispensables. And this tells the story of the men that saved our country many, many times who wouldn't even be on this radio show if it had not been for the men of the Marblehead regiment, because they saved the army um, with black powder that they brought in. They, they saved it with their money at the beginning of the war. Their decision-making process was kind of critical. Their ideas of freedom and Liberty, which still resonate today more than ever were, were early foundational concepts that they provided and then, you know, in very discernible um, inflection points during the American Revolution, they literally saved the war. And one example is at the Battle of Brooklyn, where 
literally all could have been lost. And uh, the, the war hinged on the Marbleheaders getting the army across the East River at the Battle of Brooklyn. And this is a mile-long, swirling river. And they had to do it in the middle of the night. And it, it's what I call the American Dunkirk. And literally 9,500 Continental soldiers were saved by the Marbleheaders as they ferried the army across in small boats um, with, you know, literally only two hours of preparation. And they did the impossible. Um, and this is also a situation where a, you know, many call it a, a miraculous or providential fog uh, sets in and it screens the movement of the boats as they cross the East River from the prying eyes of the British as as they, um, as dawn comes in, in light, which would expose the entire evasion, invade, uh, the entire evacuation, but they save the army there and they, they do it several times. They do it again at a place called Pell's Point where the, the British land and they initially repel an amphibious invasion at a place called Throng's Neck. And then they do it again a week later at Pell's Point and, uh, they save the army from destruction by, by a, a series of a collapsible defense, which delays the British long enough for Washington's forces to escape to White Plains. And then they, um, they come in again, as the subtitle suggests, um, at the Battle of Trenton. It's the, the Marbleheaders that row Washington across the Delaware. All other attempts failed that, that night, that, that Christmas night. But only the Marbleheaders and their skill with the boats were able to bring the army across. And they changed the course of history. And they they changed the course of history many many times as the book The Indispensables brings out. What's your advice to writers to make a living and a career like you have? I'm a I'm a dinosaur. I'm a I'm a rare endangered species. I'm one of the few that actually does this <laughs> for a living uh, full time. Um, my advice is to never quit because it's not easy. And it's full of uh, pitfalls. It would make most people pull their hair out because there's no, um, you know, it's feast or famine in many cases. I've, I've gotten to a point now where it's, it's, uh, you know, I'm very established. I'm a best-selling author, but there are times when it was hard, and still, it still is. I mean, there's, it's all about um, you can't take anything for granted. Everything is about attention to detail. In many cases, you have to do it yourself if you want it done right. Um, it's never quitting. It's following your passion. Another part of it is uh, never, I don't look at it as work. I haven't worked for 22 years full time. I love it. I love what I do. Um, it's exciting. It's every day. It's something new. I live for it. I don't. Um, look at, oh man, I just put in 16 hours doing editing and whatever. It's like, okay, it's just part of the process. I don't even look at it as a process, actually. I just look at it as, okay, it's got to be the best possible thing that you write. Otherwise, you won't be happy with it. And I always put out something very handcrafted, very, very, it's complicated in many ways, but it reads beautifully. Um, it if people had any idea how much work is behind the scenes for the books that I write, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have any idea. I mean, it's, it's serious, but um, I enjoy every one of the things that the books I've written. I'm also proud of each one of them too. You said you haven't worked in 22 years. Where did you work and uh, what made you dive in full time into writing? Well, I have always been into history since I was a kid, and uh, my hobby was always it was always history. And then when I got out of college, I was the guy that was interviewing World War II veterans. I interviewed I've interviewed well over three or four thousand World War II veterans, and I was doing it every weekend. I'd go to the reunions and stuff like that. And the prior to that, I was a um, High level management consultant with uh, IBM and Price Waterhouse Coopers, and that was an that was a great thing to learn because they had to you had to become an expert overnight in anything, <laughs> and you had to sort of adapt to your clients' needs and the, the high level stuff, and it was very high stress. But I um, I was fortunate; I was able to 
um, do all these oral histories. I created the Drop Zone Virtual Museum, and I created the first online oral history project for World War II veterans. And I also created something called e-histories. And, you know, as this thing kept rolling along, people, the men that I wrote about were saying, hey, why don't you write a book? And that's exactly what I did. And it was a New York, it was a best-selling book. It's called Beyond Valor and uh, with Simon and & Schuster. And it, that began my career. And uh, I just kept moving forward after that. Uh, there were times when it was very, it was really touch and go. It's still, it sometimes always is. You never know um, with the book business because it's, as my editor has said to me, it's it's the most competitive business in the world. There's over 125 unique um, items or things for or books for sale every year, and you're thrust into the most competitive workplace possible. And uh, I, I thrive on it. I don't the competition doesn't bother me. It's something I think I learned when I was a college wrestler and high school wrestler I was kind of looked and looked for and sought out the, the the toughest competition never never feared it and just kept moving forward I always keep moving forward I never really looked back did you write that first book while you were at IBM and Pricewaterhouse no no I didn't um I was uh I took a uh nine month sabbatical I think and uh, wrote the book and never really, I never came back <laughs> after it was a success. It was pretty cool and uh, never, uh, never looked back from there and uh, never want to. I, I know what I want. This is my calling, my passion. I love doing it. It's, uh, it's fun. I think if I, I always said to myself, if it ever not, doesn't become fun is when I'm going to not do it. And there's been times where it's been not fun, <laughs> but but uh, you just kind of keep moving forward no matter what. So are you, you mentioned that these books are taking you five years to write. Are you like funding yourself the whole time? Or are you getting, are you living from advances or how, like if you're, especially when you started, how are you doing it? Like if people are wanting to really get into being a dinosaur like you, do they just fund themselves and kind of save up for a while? Or what do you think? Well, I think that's probably the way most people would have to do it. Um, I was lucky. I was 29 years old when I first um, got uh, Beyond Valor, and I was with Simon & Schuster. I had a big, a huge advance, honestly, for, for my age. I was the youngest military historian in a major publishing house. That's what my editor told me. And I, I don't think – I mean, I was, I've was i been lucky in many ways. Um, but it, it sort of all seemed to be – I don't know how to explain it. Um, meant to be in many ways. I uh, I just kind of follow things, follow that course, and uh, God's hand, you know, just kind of follow it and just and and, 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 and I feel it and it just kind of moves me forward. And then your that that first book when you got that deal with Simon and Schuster was it just a standard you, you wrote the book you submitted a manuscript to simon and schuster they came back and said hey we love it here's your advance or was it a lot harder no what happened is um you sign a contract and i got a portion a third of the advance up front and uh and well, then i got another that? third how did how did you how did you did you know someone at Simon and Shoot? Did you just mail your manuscript in? Like, how, how did you get that contract? That, that's what I'm trying to get out of here. Yeah, sure. Um, well, at first, it sounded. At first, I I thought I had an in. Uh, my ex-wife at the time knew a publicist at at, uh, at Penguin Putnam, and uh, I I gave her the idea, and I said, Hey, can you talk to your editor about it? And she said, Sure. And uh, I got an answer I didn't expect. Uh, she said, uh, go buy a book called Literary Agents. And this thing is like a, a Bible. You go to, so I went down to Barnes and Noble and I, I bought the book and, it, you know, the thing could, you could li literally use it to, you know, it's like, like five pounds. And I, I looked in the book and you're supposed to always write a 
query letter to each agent. It's a kind of process. And uh, I just looked at that book and I, I opened it up and I opened up the back. I saw one guy that said like, he had the one little tiny phrase that said special operations forces. So I did what you're not supposed to do. I called the agent directly. And he's like, wow, this is incredible. This this website, the drop zone is amazing. It's about rangers and paratroopers and oral history of World War II. Par- it's never been done. This is a great idea. And I like, he's like, I kind of hung up the phone thinking, well, it is not really, I don't know what's going to happen. He called me back. He's like, where's your book proposal? I said, okay, give me about a month. Went back over to Borders. I got a book on how to write a book proposal, submitted the book proposal, and uh, didn't hear from him. My ex-wife at the time was like, oh, you're never going to get a book. Calls up. He's like, yeah, I got Simon & Schuster, Henry Holt, and Random House all want your book. <laughs> I'm like, all right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, just went with Simon & Schuster. And, you know, it, it didn't it, – it went well. I, I wrote the book. And uh, got got through it, and it was an incredible book. And uh, the next thing I know, the, 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 they said to me at first, they're like, "Well, this is going to be our best, are going to be our top book for the year." I was like, "Wow, that's really encouraging." I'm 29 years old, and this is going to be Simon Schuster's biggest book. Then I submit the manuscript, and uh, I'll never forget. I I submitted it, and like, yeah, that's great, and. And they had zero enthusiasm. And I'm like, what's up? You guys just paid me all kinds of money to write this book. And there's not much enthusiasm. And they're like, well, we kind of think it might be more of a, you know, this, this oral history thing is more of a, uh, it's more of a college kind of survey course thing. And I'm like, really? Come on. You just spent all this money to, to buy this book. And then they handed me a publicist who was, who had never been a publicist before. And that was a lesson, a life lesson, because my book was dead on arrival at that point, and I knew it. And I took matters into my own hands. I, I wrote my own publicity plan. I wrote my own. I like dug up all the uh, the contacts I had. I wrote the press release. I did everything for them, and then I spoon fed it to them. And the book was a huge best selling success. And it was because, and I told the editor, I said, I, get, I guarantee this book will be a best-selling book. And he just looked at me kind of like, yeah, sure. And uh, I proved him right. I proved, I say, I proved myself right, I should say. And, um, yeah, I changed the tra- trajectory of that, that, that entire book by, uh, by doing it myself and uh, not letting somebody else sort of dictate the course of the of what well, the course of events, you know, it's really about human agency. In the end, you have to be responsible for your own destiny as much as you can. Yeah, and regarding the Drop Zone Virtual Museum, can you tell us a little bit more about that organization and the virtual museum that you created? Yeah, it's something I really haven't done much with for 20 years, but this is something that I started 30 years ago, and I. Uh, you know, I wanted a museum that was online, and this is when the internet start, first started, so this is a big deal. And it, it was it was cutting edge for the time, you know. I mean, you could literally walk through the museum, you still can, and you can look at the artifacts that are in there. But the, the main thing that's the main attraction was the, the oral histories of the guys, and it was their own words. I, uh, I also had their, like, films that they took and, and scrapbooks. So it was an immersive tour, um, but it was story driven. And uh, that was a, a basis for a lot of the stuff I write. But, you know, that was the, the foundation, if you will, because it's, it's, that's one of the primary sources that I, all, I gathered myself. I, I did a lot of work with stuff that nobody had ever heard of. For instance, the, the triple nickel paratroopers. These are the first African American paratroopers in American history, and nobody had ever talked to those guys. This is 30 years ago. I did a whole area on Japanese Americans in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Uh, these are Japanese Americans that were interned by the United States government. 
but then they went on to have the greatest fighting regiments of the war. I mean, it's, I did a lot of stuff that nobody else was doing at the time. And it was my whole goal, it's still my still entire goal is to preserve and share history. And I was going after this stuff when nobody else cared. And I was trying to save these stories before these guys died. And we were able to do that. I was able to create a virtual community and also preserve and share a lot of this history. And that's what like the indispensables is all about too. It's about sharing our origin story, which is under attack at this time, but also it's, it's, it's our most precious story. It's about who we are as Americans. It's about our founding. And it's about a story that, you know, frankly, it's a miracle that this country even exists because these, um, those, those, those early, the early men and women, which I cover in the indispensables, are uh, are extraordinary. It's also a diverse regiment. It's it's got um, African Americans, Native Americans in there. There's some Hispanics, um, and it's diverse in terms of socioeconomics. It's rich and poor fighting side by side for a impossible cause for a nascent country that yet to be born, the United States. It's an it's really extraordinary story of our founding. PatrickKO'Donnell.com is the website. PatrickKO'Donnell.com. Also, thedropzone.org. Thedropzone.org. If you want to find out more about the Drop Zone Virtual Museum, Patrick, any final thoughts you want to share with our listeners or anything else you'd like to promote? Well, I would just say that freedom isn't free. Liberty and freedom are not free. They, they have to be guarded. They have to be um, – don't take anything for granted. The founding – is an extraordinary story of men and women that really did the, the impossible. And that's what the indispensables is all about. It's about human agency. It's about bending and shaping history that in many ways it shouldn't have happened through a lot of uh, grit and effort and courage. They founded our country. Yeah, completely agree. Very inspiring. Thank you so much, Patrick O'Donnell, for joining us on the Work From Home Show. To all our listeners, check us out at workfromhomeshow.com. That's www.workfromhomeshow.com. Our email is hello at workfromhomeshow.com if you have any questions or just want to say hello to us. Hello at workfromhomeshow.com. Our website, once again, workfromhomeshow.com. Follow us on all social media. Leave us a review on whatever podcasting platform you use. Get on our mailing list if you visit our website. And until next week, keep on working from home.